Okay, it's five past, so we're going to get started. Uh, but yeah, please feel free to keep on putting where you're joining. It's really interesting to see the spread. Um, so welcome to this Hope Not Hate webinar. We're going to talk about The Walk-In, the ITV drama, where uh, the story of how Matthew Collins, in fact, this story, if you haven't already bought the book, then Matthew has urged me that people should read this book. Oh, um, buy it. I don't care if you read it, just buy it. <laughs> uh, but basically the story of how Hope Not Hate um, uh, foiled a murder plot of national action. So this evening is an opportunity for Hope Not Hate supporters to find out more about exactly what happened and the true story behind the drama, to ask some questions. And if you've never met Nick and Matthew before, I guess to, to kind of meet them in a way as well. And it's something nice that we can do. You know, sometimes we are in your local areas, but sometimes we don't get round to them. So a way to meet as many people as possible. Um, so a few things to say, we've got the chat section where you've all been posting where you're from, but we also have uh, the Q&A uh, section where you can ask questions um, to Matthew and Nick and we'll answer them later. So what we're gonna do is just start off with a bit of a general conversation, maybe for half an hour, and then we're gonna work up um, work out the questions to ask you guys. God, I can see so many comments all at once. I think there's possibly a way to upvote people's questions. So if you like a question that you see in the Q&A, then you can give it a thumbs up uh, and then we'll know that that's one that everybody wants to hear the answer to. So I think that's all of the housekeeping. So we'll kind of get started. And I guess that Matthew and Nick really don't need that much of an introduction in terms of, I don't know how many combi combined years of anti-fascism you guys have, but essentially you're the people keeping the world safe even though people don't know that you're doing it, right? All undercover, you guys fighting fascism every day. What is the combined amount of years that you guys have been fighting fascism, do you reckon? 60. 60? Um, probably, okay. probably a bit more. I've, I've well, you are old. That's. <laughs> I've done 33, so you must have done about that as well. All right, yeah, so probably I first met Nick in 1996. No, 93. Oh, at the Chinese restaurant? Mm. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, for a meal, you? <laughs> so typical of you guys that it was nothing, nothing like, it wasn't a big moment, it wasn't a rally, it was a Chinese restaurant. That's like, that is the epitome of beauty. That's, uh, that's a story in itself. Can I just say hi to Mel Dearlove? who yeah. um, uh, he, he once trained a load of kids in Dagenham, gave them an FA coaching badge, and it was the most terrifying weekend of my life. There was like 20, <laughs> was like 20 kids there. And they didn't really want to do anything, but anyway, misbehaved. But Mel was very, very good, very good. And he also uh, scouted players for Liverpool, mainly from Crystal Palace. Never mind, Mel. <laughs> And John Hedges. Hi, John Hedges. Anyway. Well, we could be doing this all night, Matthew. Um, so I guess, you know, that what's that's a 30 year friendship that you guys okay. have. So it's only taken you 30 years to get an ITV drama um, where you're played by Stephen Graham and Jason Fleming. And in those 30 years, did you guys eat as much as it looks like you ate on the walk in? I swear in that drama, you're eating Mars bars and pizzas every 10 minutes. We've never had a pizza or a Mars bar. Never. And we cer certainly, we like to sit down and dine, don't we? But mainly curries. We have, we've had two or three Chinese meals, I guess, but mainly curries. See, so um, this is the content people wanted. This is the truth behind the story. That oh, they do they? Oh. I think so. Um, so I'm guessing that most people in the chat, tell me if you haven't finished, but have watched The Walk-In so far and kind of know a bit about the, about the story so far. Um, I don't know if if you want to go into Matthew, like how it came about that we that we made an ITV drama. Like how how does that happen? How do you get approached by? Did Stephen Graham want to do it? Did ITV want you to do it? Like where where does that start? No, oh, well, um, every time you write a book about an interesting topic or even uninteresting topics like like mine, but Nick will tell you this within a, within a week people come to you and say oh we're really interested in making a film and initially you get very very excited and then after about 300 offers you just ignore them but um when nazi terrorists came out there were four or five quite serious offers 
and also some skullduggery, which I won't talk about. But um, the the um, the, the ITV were, were just really, really serious about it. They read uh, hate, they'd read Nazi terrorist. They wanted to work it up and they, you know, they wanted to um, make something quite serious. And I liked them and I trusted them. That was the most important thing. Would they keep it as honest or as accurate as you can do on a television drama? Because you can't always. Uh, I asked them not to sex it up, which they, they didn't. So they were very, very good. They were very professional. They were very nice. And but I didn't believe for a minute it would get on ITV, particularly when I saw the script. With, there's a lot of swearing, never mind the eating. There was a lot of swearing and violence in it, so it's quite accurate. Um, I never thought they'd get it onto ITV, and they did. And yeah, so credit to them. But as for Stephen Graham, uh, the only thing I said was uh, not James Corden. <laughs> um, and then Neighbours came to an end, and the fat kid who plays Toady was on television saying he's out of work for the first time in 30 years. And I thought, oh, no, I'm going to be played by an Australian. So I was happy, very happy with Stephen Graham, very happy with how close as possible they could stick to the storyline. I think Nick's pretty much the same. The whole eating Mars bars and marathons and Milky Ways is not accurate at all. It's curry or nothing, really, you know. What do you think, to... what do you think, Nick? How accurate is it? <laughs> but... Um, many, many people have commented about uh, the kind of fridge behind my desk. So obviously, I just just for the record, I do not have a fridge behind my desk, but I quite like the idea of one. Um, no, I mean, I think on, on a serious level, I think there were a couple of things. I mean, clearly, you had some very well known and respected drama writers and the team coming to us, which was obviously amazing. Um, they had just done the confession which if anyone saw was a fantastic ITV drama. But I think one of the other things which I guess appealed to me as well was that they talked about the kind of difference between the audiences between the BBC and ITV. Yeah. Um, and, and the BBC tends to be more kind of middle class, you know, people who've been, been to college or whatever, perhaps a bigger, bigger um, viewers, uh, more, more viewers, but the ITV is a more of a kind of working class audience. And I think, you know, there was something probably quite appealing, not, not that I had any say in the matter at all, but there was something quite appealing about telling this story because I think that, you know, and I, I saw a question in, um, um, I saw a question in the chat from um, Pete from Wigan about Robbie. And I think to me, you know, there are many different stories within this. Obviously, the kind of main the main thing is about the the plot to kill Ro Rosie Cooper. But I also think you know part of the story is that how easy it is for someone to get attracted to the far right <clears throat> and the radicalizing process. And I think that you know um, it, it is far more common and potentially far more common than most people think. So I think that you know, given the audience that ITV dramas normally normally have. Um, and I think the final episode was watched by 7 million people, which was just brilliant. Yeah. I think, you know, it was a really, really good kind of message to, to get across. So yeah, very happy. Nice. So maybe we can go into like, what's true about it? What's not true about it? And I guess also the, the kind of impact of it, how, how accurate do you think the way that you are played is and I uh, for me what struck me is like the time frame right so that it's five quick episodes but actually how much of your life did this story kind of take up like how how long were the events that are in the series three three years three and a half years I think um yeah. yes uh, because there was a, a one year wait for the first court case then a another one year wait for a second court case so that was a lot of time spent really in limbo um which was it's not as fun as it sounds but we got through it and we had to keep robbie safe and occupied we did that as well as we could um but yeah i think it i think it's three years all up yeah. so it's a long it's so it's a long time and i guess in those years what effect did that have, I guess, or, on, on Robbie, but also on the far right? Those years when they were waiting to go to trial, 
and they were being exposed did that scare the far right do you think that people splintered off like what happened to some of those people who didn't go to trial as well well um at the time national action was banned was december 2016 um in a shed, probably about 100 members or you know, people that were closely associated with the group either walked away or, or didn't move or carry over with them. So they were down to between 60 and 100. And there were a series of there was a series of arrests. Um, there were three, I think, quite substantial operations against them. There were the soldiers in the Midlands and there was the Midlands group. And the last set of arrests were Operation Harplike, which is the one that was in relation to the uh, plot to murder Rosie Cooper. So we was actually the last ones and there was um, the competing police forces were sort of pulling their hair out with each other that they were going in the wrong order or one group was going before the other. The effect it had on, the, on those who were close to national action was the terrorists were terrorised in, in many regards. Few of them knew what was actually happening. There was very, very little leaked to the press or to the papers. There's very little information known until it actually went to court the first time. So a lot of them went into hiding. A lot of them, you know, throughout the whole time that NA was legal and then illegal. These are people very, very well trained and prepared and things like, you know, dumping laptops, dumping computers, changing identities. They were very, very good at it, I guess, because of their youth. Um, their relative skill and expertise as well in, in using social media and telephones and, and hidden apps, things like that. And I think the big the, the big challenge to them was, and still is, that many of them refused to believe, and I had this the other day on Twitter, how few of them actually believed Jack Renshaw, despite the fact he stood up in court and admitted that um, plotted to murder an MP. They, they, they cannot believe it. They still think it's part of a worldwide conspiracy. I, and I did quite an article about it after Renshaw was convicted, that they just cannot believe it. And then with regard, of course, to the child sexual exploitation, of course, which is, of course, the far right are far more worried about being accused of child sexual exploitation than they are about plots to murder female MPs or police officers. And that's become, you know, another conspiracy theory that Nick and I sort of sat outside Jack Renshaw's house. Like we've got nothing better to do than sit outside his house downloading child pornography onto Jack Renshaw's phones which is impossible to do. So the conspiracy uh, started in earnest um, when it was clear that he was up on those charges. And then after his conviction, it just got, it got worse uh, and worse in terms of how they, first of all, try and deflect what one of their number has done and been caught doing. And then secondly, how things that are proven in court, including Renshaw's own admission, suddenly that becomes part of a, a, a worldwide conspiracy. It, it's. I, I don't think it's like driven them underground either, because they were an organisation that was underground even before they were banned. People knew so so little about them. And and touching on on that, and the question for you both really, but but kind of in particular, Nick. I know that you all, as CEO, have to work with the government often. But this was a group, right, that the government claimed and the police claimed didn't exist anymore. And how? during the real events of the walk-in how did you deal with the security services with the government like what was that relationship like I, I think we can see a little bit in the drama and definitely I saw a lot on Twitter of people being quite angry um at the way the police treated you so how much of a truth is there in, in what's in the drama how was that kind of relationship well I mean I think a week before or no not even a week before a few days before Robbie came to us to tell us about the plot um i i sit on the, the government got this um uh, anti-muslim hatred working group and i'm one of the kind of independent members on there and we were having a meeting of this group um and there was a presentation by the police because there was a number of us who were critical of the police's understanding or analysis of the far right reaction to the um, terrorist attacks in, in, in 2017. So someone from the Met, I think counterterrorism, came to do a briefing at which he said that uh, national action had been smashed and didn't exist anymore. And I remember in the middle of the meeting texting uh, Matthew, messaging Matthew kind of, and we're having a bit of a laugh about it. 
Um, uh, on a serious point, I think it was, it kind of compounded the kind of stress of the whole, whole affair anyway, because um, we put the information into the police. Um, as you'll know from the drama, Matthew was on holiday. Um, so I, I put the information in via, via an MP. Um, very quickly, obviously, the police wanted the source of the information. They wanted to speak to the source and they wanted in a way to cut us out of it. Um, and then it became quite clear that the names that we were giving over meant nothing to them. They didn't know who the leader of National Action was. They didn't know half the people that, that we were talking about. Um, and then there was a particular afternoon, uh, Tuesday afternoon, where I got a phone call from a counterterrorism officer um, to explain that we were out of our depth, that we were breaking the law by doing this under the Terrorism Act. We were breaking the law by talking to someone in a terrorist group and not informing the police. And that basically, if we didn't want uh, any more problems that we had to hand over the source straight away. Um, it, I mean, it, it kind of, I, I guess there was some kind of dark, dark humor between Matthew and I on a serious level, though we, we kind of had a, had a, um, a discussion and we basically took the view that we had given a commitment to Robbie that we would protect him. Obviously, Robbie was an active member of a terrorist group and so had obviously committed, uh, um, broke the law in, in, in what he was doing. Um, and to be honest, we really didn't know much about the Terrorism Act either in terms of journalism. Under, under you know, normal, under normal law, there's exemptions for journalism, for informants, for sources, etc. But obviously, under the Terrorism Act, there kind of isn't. So we sought some legal opinion on that and I mean I think it, it was incredibly stressful we obviously gave a promise to 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 kind of Robbie that um, we we would protect him and so we held out from from the police um, and um, you know we we held out until the police finally the, the attorney general finally came to us and and offered a deal so you know that compounded it I also think that the, 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 there were some other things as well I mean clearly the way that we dealt with Robbie, the way that we looked after, after Robbie, the way that we kind of build up a relationship was very different from how the police build, build up their relationships with sources, which is really carrot and stick. They offer them money and or they threaten to stick them in prison. Mm -hmm. And um, and actually, um, du during the trial, we actually sat down, you know, anyone who's been to a kind of court case knows there's lots of sitting around outside and on, on the benches and we actually sat down we were chatting to some of the police officers um, and they actually said, did say to us that they had learned a lot from us about how we had looked after Robbie and they they realized in terms of care that we could offer Robbie more than 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 the police did in the end the, our kind of connections with with the police got better London police got taken out of the equation and that's where the problem was uh, but but the police up in the north of England uh, were, were, were kind of far, far better. But I also think policing has changed as well. I mean, the, the kind of policing has become much more proactive. They've un they now understand the threat of uh, Nazi terrorism in a way that they didn't. There's obviously still pl plenty to do. And obviously our concern is, you know, it isn't just about locking people up or whatever. It's about stopping people going there in the first place. But, um, you know, I, I think there has been some some huge changes. But it was it was an incredibly stressful summer, really. And the, the idea of Matthew and I going to prison was was, was a very real one. Mm. <laughs> You're smiling at that, both of you, but <laughs> it doesn't sound like um, fun. And again, as I said earlier, I think the fact that those five episodes looked like it all happened in about two minutes. And obviously, you know, you took that information from Robbie and, and moved quickly, but the actual whole process is, is years and years. There's a lot of people in the chat. I'll ask this question, then you can jump in, Matthew, to kind of crack on with that. But how is Robbie now is a big question that I'm seeing. Yeah. But sorry, Matthew, back to what you were going to say something else. I think. Yeah. The well, just to follow on from what Nick said, I think some people have um, made it sound as if for some moment, Rosie Cooper's life was in danger because we didn't hand Robbie over. At no point did we endanger her life. At no point did we withhold uh, evidence or information. They had access to everything. They just didn't have access to our source. And that was the, you know, that was the, um, 
that was the promise we made Robbie Mullen. What kind of people would we be if we just hand, you know, there was never in doubt that we would give that information to the police or we would cooperate. It's a murder investigation, you know, potentially a murder investigation or a terror attack. Some people have taken delight in sort of um, portraying it in, in a different light. And it's just, that's just inaccurate. And of course it's, it's nonsense. How is Robbie now? Um, he's, he's, he's getting there. I mean, he's been dealt a few harsh blows that are, as a result of this, not you know the result of the program, I guess, but also about having to continue to sort of grow and find himself in the shadow of what he's done and people's perceptions of who he is. I think maybe the walk-in was a little bit harsh on him uh, towards towards the end, but you know he's honest and he's he's working and he's trying to forge ahead with his life. And he, like we all do, like I did. He's had a few knockdowns, he's had a few knockbacks, but, you know, he's strong and he's resilient because he's come through this, mm. you know, and he, you know, he'll, he'll, he'll get better. He'll get, he'll, he'll get there in the end. It's not, it's not an easy thing for him to do. Yeah. And just, just, just to add to that, I mean, I think, you know, in the drama, um, and I think you know, this, this was a real, um, a real, um, representation that, you know, Robbie didn't just kind of, change from a fascist to an anti-fascist overnight from a racist to an anti-racist you know it's a very slow process and you know and particularly made made worse on the fact that he had to spend several years basically in hiding so he couldn't just join normal society um and yet and yet in the final episodes of the drama you you saw a change in him and and you know but i I remember at the time, um, someone, a friend of mine kind of said to me, yeah, but is he anti-racist? What's his view of this or that? And I said, well, you know, he, he is work in progress, but yeah, it's got to be, you know, we got to remember that he was a young man who made a decision that probably none of us will ever have to make. He made a decision to turn his life upside down with all the consequences that, 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 went, that went with it. And I think that, you know, he did that because it was the right thing to do. And, and, and uh, I think that, you know, it would have been so easy for him just to kind of drop out, just to disappear, just to, you know, pretend he hadn't, you know, because as soon as he made that phone call to, to, to Matthew about the plot, Matthew said to him straight away, we're going to have to go to the police on this. You know, he knew what that meant. Well, I would say, I mean, I spoke to him a couple of weeks ago, actually, and, and it, I mean, it was a really nice, you know, exchange that we had. And one of the things he kind of said, it was only really watching the drama back, watching all the episodes one after the other, that he said to me, he goes, I finally realised I'm not, I'm the exact opposite of the person I began at, I began you know, and, 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 you know, he's still work in progress, but many of us are, you know, to, to a certain extent. But I think that, you know, it's incredible. It's incredible what he's done, what uh, uh, Matthew's done and, and the toll it, you know, it, 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 it takes on people. So, um, yeah, it's good. You know, it's good. Yeah, no, it's, it's nice to hear that Robbie's doing well. And I definitely feel like that's been a theme as people watch the series, as people see seeing that journey. There's a comment um in the chat that says a big shout out to the families and friends of activists involved partners and children particularly and the often unacknowledged importance of the support they give activists um one person asked matthew is your wife a saint <laughs> and some people just asked you know like how was it for you guys personally for your families for other people and hope not hate well, obviously we've talked about the impact on on Robbie but I don't know if there's anything that you guys do want to share and please don't feel like you have to have to share any of that I'm not I'm not going to comment on my family she is a saint so she tells me <laughs> love it um nice one so I mean one question that we did get asked is Matthew do profits from your book The Walking go towards hope not hate funds yes I mean, I think that's the best question of the night. Gonna put does, Matthew look, does Matthew look rich from the uh, profits of free books? <laughs> um, so I think some of the other questions, I guess, are about, you know, it feels like with the with the Dover bomber attack this week that that there's there wasn't kind of a better time to be talking about far far right and and kind of the consequences of that dangerous rhetoric. So I guess, what do you think that the government, the police, others should learn from the walk-in that we can take forward 
um, to deal with kind of the far right now? And do you think the far right's changed since, what was it, 2017, when this all kind of kicked off? Well, I mean, I, I kind of think that, you know, the kind of key thing for me is that the far right do not operate operate in a vacuum, you know, and they are products of the society that they they come from. And, you know, Robbie, before he became active in national action, you know, took on many of the prejudices and racism of society at large, and particularly the society that, that he he lived in. And obviously, when you have a society where government ministers, large sections of the media are demonising people, are, you know, abusing people, are trying to act tough, um, it's hardly surprising then that some people you know, take it to the logical conclusion, which is 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 to commit violence. And and I think, you know, we've seen it over and over again. You know, we saw it a few years ago with the whole activist lawyer rhetoric, uh, where lawyers were were attacked to, as a consequence of that. Um, you know, we, we're obviously seeing it now, but the demonizing um and the quite conscious demonizing, and I think that that's the worst, that's the worst thing. That you know, you, we we have government ministers egged on by elements of the media who are deliberately targeting you know vulnerable people, people that they can get a quick kind of you know political hit out of, and um, you know it is it is no no surprise to me or anyone else that that attack, attacks happen. So you know, I I, I think that. It'd be nice to think that politicians learn. It'd be nice to think that elements of the media learn. Unfortunately, they don't. And, you know, every couple of years we we, we go through this again. And that's why Hope Not Hate and a range of other organisations exist, because, you know, not only do we have to hold people in power to account, but we've got to make them pay a political price for it as well. Yeah, just to add to that and going back to Robbie, one of the things we worked on him immediately was when we had to discuss some of the issues that upset him or troubled him or helped radicalize him, was trying to convince him to use different language, even if it's a difficult subject, just use different words and different language. He would never now refer to people the way that the Home Secretary has, ever. He would never use that language. And we talk about bringing him slightly further into the mainstream. Well, you know, he's, I don't think, he, I, I really don't think his views are as extreme now as the government's on migrants and, and, and refugees, and particularly the language that he uses. One of the first things we worked on with him, we know you've got issues, we know you don't like these things and those things, but talk to us in a, a more polite way and people might listen to you. And he, he would, you know, he would never refer to people the way that the Home Secretary has. Mm. Definitely. A few people have mentioned in the comments patriotic alternative as an active group in their local area, people saying that they've received leaflets through the door, or they've seen banner drops. I don't know if you, either of you wanted to comment on patriotic alternative, maybe the links between them and national action or, or kind of how you assess the threat. Again, your 60 years of combined experience, like how do you assess a threat like that? How did you assess the threat of national action as well? Like can you really tell how dangerous a group is? Nick, do you want to go first? <laughs> um, well, look, I mean, I, I mean, I think that patriotic alternative are probably the the most kind of traditional fascist group that we have at the moment. Um, you, you know, I mean, mo most of its members are former BNP members. Many of them had come from from national action after it got banned um and you know it is hardcore it is you know it is what it what it what it says it is so i mean i think on what you know that that in itself is worrying i think that they're very very active as people can see i mean they they've talked about and they've tried to get registration with the um, um electoral commission so they can stand in ele uh, in elections i think if they do they would stand up quite a lot of candidates because it'd be very similar to the kind of bnp where you have these very small units um who stand candidates generate publicity generate you know local paper art papers um coverage etc so i mean i you know i i think certainly we we have to be really vigilant on about them um we have we have to kind of expose them for what they are because they are hardline racist and fascist 
Um, but, at same, but at the same time, I think we have to do that carefully and we, we have to make sure that we don't give them the publicity that they, that they really um, thrive on. Often it is literally two, three men and a dog um, who, go, who go out. So I, I think, you know, it's important that we are really accurate in how we, how we write about them. Uh, but at the same time, they, there's a massive overlap in, in their relationship with National Action yeah. or former members, which segues into Matthew. Yeah, it was interesting in the court case of Alex Davis, who was sort of the founder and main ideologue of National Action, that he'd met with Patrick, Patriotic Alternatives leader and they'd had discussions about the sort of activities that PA should do and like Nick says it's you know it, it it's quite different and also quite similar to the old BNP um mainly because of well how important social media has become for the for the far right but one of the things I always talk about with Patrick's alternative is PA is that their leaders are 42 or 43 year old men who spends a lot of time gaming online in these imaginary worlds where people have superpowers so they can burn down villages and jump over buildings and all this and make themselves invisible. And so he plays these sort of games with these young supporters. And then he complained that a woman in his game, one of these female characters in his game, had unrealistic powers or something. You know, so... <laughs> I, I don't think they're going to have a, a mass electoral appeal like like the BNP did because I think they're they're quite strange. I think what they could possibly be capable of is building a a movement similar to what the National Front was, so that people know them and recognise them, as opposed to perhaps want to vote for them. The electoral re returns for the far right at the moment are absolutely appalling. Mm -hmm. um, but you know we don't we don't judge how dangerous groups are on their electoral appeal. You know, quite quite simply that it's an ideological problem that the things that they believe and the things that they want are unacceptable in a civilized society. And what underpins what they believe and underpins what they want is, of course, violence. So that's how I, you know, that's how I view patriotic, patriotic alternative. But it's also far more fractious than any other far right group I can ever remember. Uh, their members fall out with each other a lot. I guess that's one of the problems with spending all day on internet games having superpowers um, in the real world you probably just don't match up to your own expectation that's the best bit about your far right roundup blogs on the on the website guys is is seeing all of the fights that they get into in the various fractions and the people's front of judea oh, some of the stuff we have there. to keep off some of the stuff um, yeah. a few questions that kind of link to what you were just saying there matthew is like i guess it's a two-part question like are there women in the far right? And if not, why not? But also, I guess there's a trend increasingly, this misogynistic, extremely violent trend in the far right, or, you know, these kind of slip roads through people like Andrew Tate. So I guess from both of you, just a bit of a a few words on what are women's roles in the in the far right? Like, are they involved? Do you want me to go? Nick, do you want to go first? You, you go. Thank you. Um, well, I mean, my history is in the far right and um, we weren't called incels back then, um, but we were also involuntarily celibate. <laughs> um, I, the first real explosion we saw of female activists was in the EDL. We'd never seen so many women active in the far right. The EDL had a really large number of female activists and that was both frightening and I guess interesting because one of the things that we that that we understood about the far right was that it was women tended to be the ones who most rejected that those messages of hatred so it was interesting and concerning we saw it in we saw it in, in the EDL um, but now in sort of groups that are becoming more traditional far right the sort of deputy leader of the of, of Britain first uh, believes that women's a woman's place is at home in the kitchen. Um, this growing in incel culture of young boys who who whose hatred of women is almost off the scale, and these incels who claim that they're you know that women won't have sex with them, which is basically what it is, 
no woman's going to want to have sex with an incel who spends all day on the internet ranting about how much he hates women. We have seen as well in like post NA groups now with this, this new ideology, how white jihad has, has grown and, and spread, how women are seen as the sort of almost the enemy, the hatred of, of, of women, the encouragement that women should be, how women should be treated and how women should be raped. There was a thing in the old far right, how women would be worshipped. You know, you would worship them. Obviously, you wouldn't let them out of the house, but you certainly wouldn't encourage people to go back and beat them and rape them. And we're seeing more and more of that language. And one of the things I said recently in another interview was there's elements of the far right, I guess those people that follow the white jihad rules, whereas groups like Patri Patriotic Alternative and Britain First have this idea that one day they'll rule the country. In these sort of post-national action groups or this ideology post-national action, where there is no interest in taking power because it's all just about killing and maiming people they don't like. So they have no interest in repopulating. You know, Britain First and National Front, all those groups will talk about when we come to power, everyone will have 2.4 white children and should be indoors all day, cooking, cleaning and making apple pie. In the sort of post NA world, that sort of politics, it's all about there'll be no homes, it will all be destroyed and all women will be dead. So the women's role in the far right, I, I guess it varies, but it's not a progressive one, is, is it? I mean, really, you're, you're dealing with a, having had a, a, a small uh, period where women were quite active and important. Uh, it's now back to being completely male dominated uh, by, I think, the most dark and, and desperate males I've ever seen in the far. In 30 years, I've never seen people as desperately dark and dangerous as these people. I mean, I, I kind of also think it depends what element of the far right we're talking about. I mean, I think that when Matthew was talking about the women in the EDL, I think issues to do with Muslims, with grooming gangs, more more women are are involved. But the traditional far right, the kind of Nazi far right, um, ha has had this huge shift in the last couple of years. I mean, frightening what last four or five years, which has been frightening. I mean, if, if you think back to the National Front or the BNP 20, 30 years ago, the, the kind of woman's place was in the kitchen at home, you know, the kind of the, the leader of the BNP once wrote an article complaining about how he once caught his wife wearing a skirt while <laughs> was, was doing the gardening. You know, it was these kind of traditional kind of... Um, um, these these traditional roles of, of of women in the home. What we've seen in the last few years, and particularly from the younger people, I mean, this is this this is what's really quite worrying, um, and particularly amongst the kind of teenagers, is is that sexual violence is a political tool, and so this whole rape culture, this whole kind of sexual violence, demonising, abusing, it's kind of sharing of imagery videos etc the most horrendous stuff that we're seeing these kind of 14 15 16 year olds who are in the kind of the, these nazi groups share um and some of it's got an overlap with satan nazi satanism but it's like i, I sometimes wonder that you know when, when i first got involved we had you know there was still the big skinhead movement obviously the football hooligan world combat 18 and to become a name in, in those in those periods, you had to be hard. It was a drink fight culture. You know, you proved yourself by, by being a good street fighter. Whereas now, where the world, particularly amongst these teenagers, has gone onto the internet, where really, you know, a seven, you know, eight stone kid could be, you know, 22, you know, eight, 16 stone muscle man on the internet, you know, and in a sense that to become hard and big on the internet, you become more extreme. And some of the stuff that's getting shared now is just, I have never seen anything like it. And it, it's just like, I mean, it's horrendous. And, and obviously, you know, I think the worrying thing is that we're seeing some of this mirrored just in school anyway. You know what I mean? This kind of violent misogyny that's kind of growing. And of course, not, not all, all, all young, young people are like this, but there is, I think, a greater acceptance and the greater kind of visibility of kind of violent um, misogyny, which obviously the Nazis and the political extremists take take to to the extreme. But I mean, you know, I I really worry because um, 
you know, particularly with, with, with this kind of rape culture, which is quite widespread on, on, on the margins. Um, really, really dangerous stuff. And, and, you know, there are one or two women in this world, not many. I mean, there are one, one or two. And I mean, it, it's a fairly miserable life for, for those people. And often they don't realise until afterwards. Um, but it is predominantly kind of um, a young man's world. And I think what's quite interesting, you know, we're getting a few questions from people who maybe live in an area that's targeted by the far right and people from from Telford in here, but how gr some groups who are on that more extreme misogynist kind of space are actually linked to Tommy Robinson. And so we're getting a few questions on kind of how should people locally in Telford kind of tackle what, what's happening there but I guess also maybe Nick I know that you soon have a book coming out about Tommy um look there it is um how is he connected to this online world because he's kind of the one of those exceptions to the rules right where he's kind of across those two spaces and that's quite interesting yeah I mean I think that he he is a kind of phenomenon which is it's hard to put in a particular box um, partly because he has been able to kind of monetize the far right in a way that no one else has, has ever been able to, um, literally to the tune of millions. Um, and he's very charismatic. He's He obviously does his provocative films and everything, which is all, he does that on purpose. He does that on purpose because his supporters um, like it. But I, I kind of think that I'd answer that, this question in a couple of ways. I mean, I think that there are sometimes some real issues that there are genuine grievances people have and that if society doesn't address those, um, they become exploited by whether it's Tommy or whether it's, you know, BNP in the old days or, or whatever. So I, th I think that, you know, grooming is an issue and on, on street grooming, um, child sexual exploitation, it has gone on far too long in far too many communities and far too many ways, you know, when, unfortunately, when men have a position of power or an opportunity, there, there are some men who do outrageous things. And I think that we as a society should have done more. And I think, you know, young, vulnerable people have been let down. Um, so on one hand, that sometimes the best way to fight it is just as a society dealing with, dealing with some of these issues. I, I think also in terms of Telford, um, and as my book, which is coming out ne next week, will show, um, you know, he has clearly um, exploited a situation for his own benefit and his own financial gain. Um, he has demonised a whole community. Um, you know, some of the stories he tells are kind of aren't exactly true or exaggerated or whatever. But I mean, I, I think I think what what is important that we must never forget that there are real victims here real people who have suffered awfully and in whatever we do whether it's opposing uh, opposing tommy whether whether that's campaigning in the community we have to put survivors and, and victims first because you know we we as a movement are have been sometimes have have uh, forgotten that and i i think that that's that's really important at the same time at the same time we we need to expose Tommy and people like him for for what they are. They are exploiting people in a slightly different way, but they're exploiting people's misery and exploiting people's stories for their own, not only their own financial gain, but but also to demonize whole communities and to, to drive a division amongst communities. My own experience, particularly up in Yorkshire and Keefley, where we did quite a lot of work around the whole grooming issue, is that the vast majority of people vast majority realise there's good and bad in all communities and the vast majority want to live in a society where communities aren't at war, war with, with each other which is obviously what Tommy and his gang are, are quite keen to do so I mean I think that you know um, there are ways there are ways to 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 address this but um, you know and I'm very happy I'm very, if anyone is from Telford and wants to do some stuff or wants to kind of chat to me I will be coming up to Telford fairly soon to do a, um, um, an event around my book but I'm, I'm very happy to to have um, a chat to people off offline as well. What an offer anything from you Matthew on on that question if you can even remember the thread of where we're at on that. <laughs> no, no I think I think Nick 
covered it. I think the thing as well that we see with conspiracy theorists and all those people who are sort of attached on the fringes of the far right is that these people have often suffered uh, genuine uh, incidents of unfairness or being treated unfairly, and they don't have the tools. They don't, and they don't have the context, or they don't understand how to deal with sometimes the really awful things that happen in their in their lives, and they don't know how to redress them. And they don't have access to uh, free free legal advice like they used to for the citizens' advice bureaus, and so they find themselves in the only way that they can make sense of some of the things that have happened to them is to believe the conspiracy because mm. you know people you know we are seeing people in the far right who have genuine grievances that just were never addressed yeah so we've done all the hate and i feel like we probably need to spend like the last 10 20 minutes talking about the the hope and also giving people a chance to get any final questions into the q a and to upvote their favorites but i wondered if you guys could talk about things that have gone well this year, things that we have achieved kind of as an anti-fascist movement, as Hope Not Hate, or things that you're you're kind of looking forward to, to doing in the future in the, in the way that we, we tackle fascism in this country. Like, are there any positives that you can leave people with tonight, whether that's something we've already done or something we will do? Well, we have, I think, far more people passing us information and wanting to work with us or for us than we've ever had before. Um, we're getting the sort of far right music scene, which is, you know, sort of quite aged, but still quite nasty. That's on its knees. Um, we're doing some work with, I'm not gonna talk too much about it, but with some, in, in a way, how to pressure ven venues legally now. There, there, there's ways which are being brought to our attention that we can stop people allowing far-right activists to to lie their way into venues it's no there's no good these venues saying we didn't know so there's avenues now open to us to work on that and um i think i'm going on holiday so that's <laughs> finally that's finally getting that bloody holiday i mean just 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 to add, add some hope i mean um one of the things i mean that we have been doing a lot over the last few years has been growing our um educational work and I, I think that for me it's been really exciting that um, one of my frustrations and I think I, I spoke about this at the beginning but one of my frustrations is that the police and the authorities often take a very kind of law and order view of everything you know like the whole prevent thing it's you know to me by the time a young person goes in to prevent a young person gets picked up by the police we as a, as a society have failed. It's like, how can we stop people getting to that stage? And how can we stop people kind of going down, down the rabbit hole? So, you know, what we've been doing at Hope Not Hate over the last um, couple of years was, so, you know, really positively expanding our, our work in schools. Um, we, we are now the second biggest provider of kind of anti-racist education work. We've recently set up um, um, a, a DRAD program to try to kind of work with kind of vulnerable young young people. So, you know, to me, that's that's really positive. How can we stop people going down the kind of robbery route in the first place? Um, but I also think that you know we've 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 got a really fantastic community program in Bradford, for example, where we are working in an area that was traditionally kind of a BNP stronghold, a UKIP stronghold, quite a kind of you know. Uh, at very bad attitudes to Muslims and we've been working there now you know regularly for several years and um, we, we had a community festival there in the summer um, which, which had over 1500 people at it you know from the local estate that we've been working on so you know and, and of course there are lots of really great stories from around the country and I do think it's really important that we amplify those um, it's very easy, and particularly for us and the work that we do, it's very easy to kind of focus on, focus on the hate, focus on the negativity, focus on the, the many bad things that, that are going on. But actually, all over the country, people are standing up to hate, people are trying to bring communities together. And, you know, really, for me, one of my kind of aims and passions over the next kind of few years is like, how can we amplify that? How can we link people up? It's not about us coming in to do things. You know, people in the communities are doing fantastic things. So, you know, if you are involved in good community work, if you've got some exciting projects, please tell us so we, we can share those um, with kind of others as well. 
There's a few questions in the chat about um, the Nazi gigs. So over the last few months, well, these crop up every so often, right? Like we we have to try and uh, stop some Nazi gigs and people want to know how do you do that? And I guess some of it we might not be able to talk about, but some of it you might. Um, I think half of it is getting people riled up, right? <laughs> but I don't know if you guys want to share a bit of some of the stories of how you've stopped Nazi gigs either this year or in the past. Well, I think the the thing is that I think people are aware that we generally operate on a fringe of society, even though, of course, you know, the walk in was massive. But most of the work we do is on the fringes of society. Uh, a lot of pubs and small venues, of course, have been really badly hit uh, even before COVID, but certainly post COVID and lockdown. And they tend to be slightly more open or willing to maybe holding gigs that they think might be slightly edgy. And what we I do is, but everyone has their own approach in the organisation. What I tend to do is try and get local people to make representations to the landlord. And if that doesn't work, then I'm not talking about violence, but there's other ways now that, that we can force um, legally. Now, it looks as if we can force venues not to do it. The, 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 look, the, the important thing about these Nazi gigs is it's, you're looking at people even older than Nick sometimes for organising these things. <laughs> And these gigs spread, these gigs can spread violence. You get a lot of very angry, drunken people being listening to really horrific racist lyrics all evening. And, you know, they can go out and, and cause trouble. I think we've seen it plenty, plenty of times. It's not so much that we don't like crap music, but it is mainly about the effect that these gigs still have in, in communities where they turn up. But of course, Nick's the expert. He's got the largest vinyl collection of screwdriver records in the country. <laughs> I mean, can I, can I just say, I mean, I mean, not, you know, it, it's not always possible, but really what we try to do is link um, intelligence and campaigning. So, yeah. for example, with with witness, um, we obviously we, we had the venue, we had the background on the, the band. We knew that the landlord of the of the venue was friendly to the organizer of the gig so that meant we knew straight away that just appealing to his good nature wasn't going yeah. to work and that we had to go to the we had to go to the council um so i mean you know it really varies the more information that we have beforehand the better our chances of stopping a gig because you can straight away work out you know so for example over the last couple of years we've we've helped stop many kind of foreign nazi bands coming into the uk um, simply because we had the intelligence that people were arriving. And of course, that in itself costs, I mean, for example, the, there was a gig on Saturday that we stopped in Essex, um, um, a Combat 18 gig. Now, it cost the organisers and it cost the band who flew over from Finland uh, £1,500. It's getting to the point they're so demoralised, they really can't put on a gig anywhere without us knowing about it. Um, and it's getting to the point where people are start, starting to kind of drop out. Now, if we can stop the number of Nazi gigs, Nazi events, then that's that's all good. But, you know, we're more likely to do that if we have the have the information, not only where the venue is, but the background of the people, the photographs. There's a gig coming up fairly soon, which I, I won't announce where that is quite yet. But there, there's a gig coming up where we have photos of the landlord with with, with people. So you know, it's all it's all important stuff. Putting them on notice right now if they're uh, <laughs> hacked yeah. into the <laughs> to the Zoom. Um, so we're probably going to wrap up in a second. But I guess I mean Nick's already said it. But if you are active in your local area and want to help us tackle anti-fascism then you can get in touch with hope not hate but i wanted to open the floor if there's anything else that you guys didn't get to say that you wanted to say whilst we've got a captive audience of people send us an email mel nice okay and, 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 and can i just say at the beginning i kind of i i um i saw someone on on the chat who I went to college with 30 years ago. I think there are two people I went to school with. Now, that was even longer ago. <laughs> um, I won't say how many years, so a big hello to those people. And no one from my school was on here, by the way. That's outrageous. Oh, okay. And um, people have said, this has been great. Can you arrange another scene? So maybe, you know, maybe we'll do a Tommy one in a few weeks once Nick's books come out. So if you go onto the Hope Not Hate website, you will see a link to buy Matthew's book 
the walk-in and there is also uh nick's book tommy which is coming out next week and um, we'll also make sure that you all get a uh, link in an email tomorrow morning you know when you're thinking oh what a great event that was we'll send you a link to the books as well but thanks everyone for joining and thanks Matthew and Nick for answering so many questions in an hour that was um that was a real marathon I think <laughs>